All right, look, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Praise God. We'll start in verse 1. And um, I'll just read verse 1 real quick, and then we'll kind of get into the message. It says, uh, seeing the crowds, I'm in the ESV version. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And I just wanted to, to make the point that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 through 29, you don't really have to go there. It's at the end of this long discourse. So this is really, you know, I take this to be Jesus's first really coming out message, you know, and, and it was a long discourse of a lot of information about his kingdom. And at, at, in Matthew 7, at the end of it, it says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And so what I wanted you to see there is that whenever Jesus is preaching this message and he says that the disciples came to him, it's not talking about just those 12, amen? But instead, it was, you know, the word disciple means to be a learner of Christ. And so there was in the crowd people that had the desire to hear what it was that he had to say. Now, one of the things that I want you to know about the gospel of Matthew is that, and I've said this before, but let me just say it again, is is that when you follow the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew, what you see is that it brings you straight through Solomon. And I believe that's important because and it brings you through Solomon and it brings you to Joseph. And not to make too big of a deal about this, but had Israel as a nation not been disobedient towards God in the Old Testament, had they not been brought under the bondage of Nebuchadnezzar when he went and he took Daniel, Shadrach, and, you know, and brought him into Babylon, had that not happened, then according to the text, Joseph would have been the rightful heir to the throne. He would have been the rightful king, Joseph the carpenter, that was the, the earthly father of Jesus, and then we see in the lineage of Mary that actually it goes through King David's lineage again, but it's a different son, Nathan. And so I just wanted to make that point to you is that that the gospel is really focused on Jesus as king. And, and that's what I get out of the gospel of Matthew. It's focused on Jesus as king. And we see also the kingdom parables. Right? The ten virgins, the kingdom of heaven is like this in the parable of the sower. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And so what we're seeing in my understanding of this message, and this is just the beginning of it, and I might actually park here for a while for on Wednesdays, um, because I think it's important that we hear the words of our Lord. Amen. And um, so what I'm seeing here is that kind of like also in the Old Testament, Moses had to go to the mountain by himself to hear the voice of God because the people trembled, right? And the people weren't allowed to go up and Moses went up and he got the, vo the word of God and, and he brought it back down to the people. But in this particular uh, passage of scripture, what we see is that Jesus is the manifestation of God and Jesus is the voice of God and the people are invited to come up and to hear what it is that he has to say. I think it's it's very important that people understand that Jesus still speaks today. Amen. Praise God. And, and, and look, I want you to know that that sometimes it's difficult to understand what Jesus is saying, because sometimes we're, we're trying to operate in a natural mindset. And, and look, I, 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 we, we've been saying this a lot lately. It's extremely important that people are truly converted and they really give their heart over to the Lord. I can't really emphasize that enough because I am concerned that in the modern church that there's there, that the gospel has been changed so much. When I say the gospel, that the things that are spoken from behind the pulpit have been changed so much that people don't really want to talk about sin anymore. They don't want to talk about repentance because they're so concerned that they're going to offend people that it's likely that there's so many people sitting in churches that have not truly been converted. Because see, in order for true conversion to take place, we have to be sorrowful in our heart that we sinned against God. We have to be sorrowful in our heart that we sinned against his word. And we have to repent. The word of God says repent. John the Baptist preached the baptism of repentance. Jesus Jesus said, the kingdom of God is here. Repent. And what does it mean to repent? It means to change your mind. And it means that when there's a mind change, and what is, what is that even talking about? It's talking about when my mind lines up with his mind. Amen. Whenever I see what the word of God says, and I'm like, I was wrong, Lord. 
I was wrong. You were right. And Lord, I repent. I'm sorry. And, and, and I give you my life. You gave your life for me. And I give you my life right here, right now. Well, I don't have to wait another minute. I can pray it right. Lord, give me, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Forgive me. And listen, when you mean business with God, okay, when you mean business with God from your heart, because that's what the word of God says in Romans 10. You got to believe with your heart. Amen. And when you believe with your heart, a miracle happens. Amen. The Holy Spirit moves in. Amen. And then now from then on, it's about us yielding to him. Amen. It's a constant battle where the spirit and the flesh, according to Romans chapter five, are contrary to one another. And they're in a battle. See, our flesh doesn't want to die, but the spirit in us, the Holy Spirit in us is bringing our spirit alive and saying, no, that stuff needs to die. That stuff that I'm convicting you about needs to go. Yes. Amen. Because I'm here to bring you free. That's it. And the devil wants to keep you bound up. Yes. And that's what the devil always wants to do. He wants to keep people bound up. Amen. And he wants to prevent them from going his way. So, so now what, what I'm trying to say is, is that once, once a person is truly converted and the Holy <laughs> Spirit moves into their heart, now there's the opportunity not to only operate in a natural mind, but... But now the mind can be renewed and the Holy Spirit allow, helps us to have understanding. Really, without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can't understand the things of God. Right. And so the Holy Spirit really needs to be the teacher tonight. The Holy Spirit needs to be the counselor tonight. The Holy Spirit needs to be the comforter in your life. tonight. And I venture to say that he's already making himself aware in people's lives and saying, hey, listen, I'm here to comfort. I'm here, I'm here to counsel you. I'm here to let you know how much I love you. Amen. And he's Amen. proven. Praise God. Amen. And so, so with that said, I want you to know this is a king and he's preaching to the citizens of the willing citizens. Now, they're, I can't say that they're all born again yet because there's a lot, you know, I could say about that. But they're coming to hear what he has to say. And I got to tell you that Jesus's kingdom is altogether different than the kingdoms that you and I are used to. Does that make sense? And hey, listen, I talk about these things a lot. But look, Jesus was born in a manger amongst animals. Kings are not born in mangers. Kings are born in palaces. Kings are not wrapped in, well, they might be wrapped in swaddling clothes, but it's probably clothes made, it's, it, cloths, it's probably cloths made out of silk, right? And kings don't ride in the town on a donkey. They ride in the town on a white stallion. Kings, kings don't lower, don't, you know, lower themselves. Instead, they're exalted. Kings don't die for their people. Their people die for them. And so it's a complete reversal of, 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 of the word of God and what, what this king looks like and what this kingdom looks like than compared to what we're used to. Right. And especially really in our nation, you know, our nation is, well, I mean, thank God for our nation. Praise God. But you know, I want to say this to you. The Lord's been burning a message in my heart. And I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to preach it Sunday. I, I don't want to let the cat out the bag, but I just want to say this. I'm concerned that the church doesn't really understand what we're up against. Amen. I'm concerned the church doesn't really understand what we're up against. We think we're just up against a specific party, but I'm here to tell you it's so much bigger than that. That's right. The battle is so much bigger than that. Right. We're in a spiritual war. Right. And there's a transition yeah. taking place. And now is the time for the people of God to wake up That's and to right. be spiritually sober. Amen. 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 It's time for us to get our hearts right and our minds right and our heads right and our hearts right with the king. Amen. It's time. Praise God. All right. So here's the king. Now, look, let, let's um, let's go ahead and take a It says in verse two of Matthew chapter five. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying that if you have, if you're poor in spirit, then the kingdom of heaven is going to be yours. Now, I don't know about you, but when I begin to define poor out of the Greek dictionary in the Strong's, there's a part that it doesn't go real well with some modern preaching is what I'm trying to say. It, it, poor means to crouch, to cringe, to be a pauper. You know what a pauper is? It's like a beggar. And not a prince. It's the opposite of a prince. A prince is a royalty. A prince is established. A prince is high and lifted up. But a pauper is beggarly. 
Now, what I do want to tell you is this. He didn't say for you to be poor in finances. He didn't say for you to be poor in health. He didn't say for you to be poor on the societal ladder. He said for you and I to be poor in spirit. He said that those that are poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, one thing that I will tell you that I've learned through the years is that the opposite of poor is pride. And, and the word of God says that he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen. And so what I, that I wanted you to see that, I don't want you to hear that, that, that also in this idea of poor in spirit is the difference between independence versus dependence. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn from Jesus. For us to really understand what our Lord was saying, we have to go through the rest of Scripture and we have to see, we have to look at the Word so that we can grab a hold of His heart. So we can, so we can get a, we go, go through the Word of God, amen, the rest of the Bible, and specifically Jesus' teachings, so that we can grab a hold of what was really in Him and what He was really saying, so that we can understand Him better. Amen. And so in John chapter 12, this is one thing that Jesus said, John 12, 49 and 50. He said, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that this commandment, his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the father has told me. Now I have to tell you, that probably about two months ago, I saw this verse of scripture and I've tried to read it out to y'all more than once. And I don't know that it's hitting as hard as what it needs to hit. But in verse 50, when I see that he says, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. Jesus is saying this is really, really important stuff. This is really important information for people that are going to believe in the word of God and people that are going to believe and what God is doing on the earth for you and I to understand that eternal life is very serious. And the commandment, you understand what I'm trying to say? God has provided eternal life. And, and, I, and I'm concerned that, that we, all of us that are in this house tonight, have taken at times in our walk. I'm not saying that you're there now. But at times in our walk have taken for granted the word of God, the blood of Jesus, the, the, the spirit moving upon our hearts. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. And we've taken for granted. Amen. The things of God. And we just thought, oh no, everything's good. I'm cleansed by the blood. And, and, I'm, and I'm, trying to, I'm trying to explain to you tonight. That it's, it, it's very important that we look. That we become spiritually sober. And that we allow God to have his way. But look what he said. He said, I don't speak on my own authority. I speak only what I hear my father speak. So what I want you to understand is this. We learn from Jesus. We're not independent. We're dependent. We're poor in spirit because we need him. Amen. The scripture says that in my weakness, that's what the apostle Paul said. In, in, in Jesus, Jesus actually told the apostle Paul. The apostle Paul said, I got a thorn in my flesh. This thing won't leave me alone. Scholars been arguing over what the thorn is. He didn't tell us what the thorn was. We don't need to know what the thorn was. You got a thorn. He had a thorn. And what we need to understand is this: that I asked the Lord to take this thorn from me, but He said, "No, my grace is sufficient for you. For in your weakness, my strength is made perfect." I got good news for you tonight. You might feel weak walking up in this place, but if you'll turn your eyes on Jesus and if you'll look full in His wonderful face, then the things of this life will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. But you got to turn your eyes on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, make me weak so I can be strong in you. Amen. Lord, make me weak. Move me, move me out the way. If there's less of me, there's more of him. Amen. If there's less of me, there's more of him. And that's what he's trying to tell us. His word is full of that. But look at Philippians. Here's another one. Philippians 2 and verse 6. Though he was in the form of God. We're talking about Jesus before he became flesh. Though he was in the form of God. Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. And he took the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. To the point of death. Even the death of a cross. The Apostle Paul, before that part of the scripture, said this. 
Let the same mind be in you that was in him. Amen. Though he was in the form of God, he didn't consider it something to be grasped to. He lowered himself. The Lord wants you and I to be humble in his presence, to be humble, to lower ourselves in his presence, to acknowledge that he's the king. Amen. And that we are his citizen. We are his child. He's and, and, and that, that we belong to him. Amen. And that we to approach him properly with dignity and respect, with reverence. Understanding that he's holy and he's righteous, but you got to understand that he loves you. He loves you so much. He laid, he sent his son to die for you. Amen. Praise God. So there's a scripture in, in Matthew 18 where the Lord says this, and I'm just going to read it to you. He says, at the same time, the disciples that came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, see, that's the opposite of a poor spirit. That's a pride spirit. Because, and if you've studied the disciples, if you'll remember the story of the sons of thunder, it was what John and James, the sons of Zebedee, and they came one time with their mom, and Jesus had just talked to them about the cross. He just said, I'm about to go to Jerusalem, and the son of man is going to suffer many things. And then all of a sudden, they walk up there with their mama, and your mama says, hey, which one of my boys can sit at your right hand when you enter your throne? And it's like, what? They're seeking a good position. And Jesus goes on in that story and he begins to explain to them something similar to what he says right here. So it says in Matthew 18, you can go ahead and go there a little. Matthew 18, verse 1, at the same time the disciples came unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so what we understand is, is that God is expecting his believers to come to him as a little child, understanding that they are dependent upon him. Understanding that they're poor in spirit and they're, and, and they're dependent upon the Lord. And they're like, I can't do it. Now, I'm not telling you to walk around poor in spirit when you're dealing with the world. I'm not telling you to walk around with poor in spirit. I'm not telling you to be cocky and I'm not telling you to be arrogant. I'm trying to make a point. There's a difference between approaching your king with a humble and poor spirit and also whenever you're about the business of the Lord. Because he's also said this, that those that have been converted, he has given them power and authority to be the sons of God. Amen. What, what we lost in Adam, we gained back in Christ. And the Lord's looking to fill some people up with the power and the anointing of his Holy Spirit and that they would that they would be incense for him, vessels that he can live in and that he can flow through, that he can accomplish his will upon this earth. Hey, I don't want you to be poor in spirit if you're dealing with demonic spirits. I don't want you to be poor in spirit whenever people are coming against you, but at the the same time there's a way to battle that you don't battle flesh to flesh the word of God says you're not in a wrestling match with flesh and blood the way you battle that is spiritually Amen. and you bring it to the Lord I bring it to the Lord that's what we do and Lord help us when we don't amen so we got to come to him as a little child person who, under, who is poor in spirit understands that without God moving on his heart, he'll be lost in darkness. He understands that he is clay in the hands of a potter. That he is a child and God is his father and that his father is to be respected and honored. He understands that his father's word is to be respected and honored. He is poor in spirit towards his father and this affects the way he handles human relationships. You understand what I'm saying? See, Whenever we're poor in spirit towards our Father, when we're humble in His presence, and when we seek Him and we do, we allow time to be spent with Him. Listen, you know what? We can grow in the time amount of time we spend with our Lord. Sometimes it just starts off real soft. But let me tell you one thing that I've been doing lately because you know I, I don't know I've, I've been all over the place. In the way that I pray, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I come over here, there. I can't even tell you my prayer. My prayer life has gone from one extreme to the other. But lately, this is just something. Sometimes I just come in here and I'll sit in that chair right there, and I'm just like, Lord, 
I'm just so grateful that I can be with you. <laughs> and I'll just sit there and I'll start thanking her. <clears throat> and I don't even know how long the prayers last, but I just know this. At some point in time, he shows up and I'm just trying to be real with him. And I'm just trying to let him know how thankful I am for what he's done in my life. Amen. And I'm not saying that one prayer is better than another prayer because sometimes my prayer don't look like that. Sometimes my prayer doesn't sound like that. Sometimes it sounds a whole lot different. It's a lot louder. But what I'm just trying to say is, is that this is that he loves you. He loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you and he wants to be intimate with you. And he paid a high price so that you could come to him. You understand what I'm trying to say? Jesus died so that you could enter the presence of the holy God. And he wants you to come and he wants you to trust him and he wants you to speak to him. And if you will do that, I'm telling you, things will start to change. Right. Thank God for the cross. Amen. Thank Amen. God for your blood. Lord, Amen. Because it's what gets me into the presence of God. Amen. Yes. And, and when you get into the presence of the Lord, you know what will happen? The Holy Spirit's going to start speaking to you. I'm telling you right now, if you really get into the presence of the Lord, he's going to start Changing some stuff around. Amen. I'm not going to get all rowdy like I do sometimes and start kicking Kleenex boxes and all that. But that's kind of like what will happen sometimes in your spirit when you get close enough into the presence of the Lord. You'll start kicking some boxes around on the inside or showing you some things to help you. Amen. And we release that to him and he heals us because, oh, it's a beautiful thing. But what will happen is, is he'll start to change and rearrange the way that our relationships with the people around us are. Okay. And we can keep going because really he, he keeps going. So in verse four, he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. To mourn, the definition is to grieve. Mourning over someone or their death. You know, I did a word study in the New Testament and most of the time that the word mourn was used, it was connected to some form of tragedy or death. I'm not saying every time I didn't look at it that closely, but I was scrolling through and time and again, I was recognizing the scriptures and it was interrelated to death and to tragedy and to pain and heartache. You know, because of the fall of man, there is pain and heartache on the earth. I know that I'm not the only one that has experienced pain and heartache. We've all experienced pain and heartache. But this is talking, I wanted just to give you an idea of what mourning means. But I need you to understand that this is to mourn over what God mourns over. God, I want you to know that God is, God mourns. I believe that. God is full of emotion. We see that in Jesus' life, right? We see, G the Bible says Jesus is the express image of the Father. When we see him, we see the heart of the Father. And the Bible, the shortest verse in the Bible, in, in the Gospel of John, at Lazarus, his friend's funeral, says that Jesus wept. Everyone around him was mourning. And I got to tell you that if you go all the way to the end of the story and then you start to think about it and deconstruct it, you know something. Jesus knew what he was going to do before he ever took off on the journey. As a matter of fact, they sent him a message. He was far away. They sent him a message. They said, your friend whom you love, he's sick, even to death. <laughs> and, and he said, uh, he, and he says, let, let us wait just a little bit. I preached a message one time, time of four day dead. He waited just a lot. We gotta, we, we gotta let him be. He was dead for four days by the time Jesus showed up. He said, let us go to our friend Lazarus. He sleep. Oh, if he's sleeping, he'll be okay. No, he's dead. But Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead for various purposes. One, to show his power. But number two, the Bible teaches us in Luke chapter 16. You remember the story whenever the rich man and, and another man named Lazarus, not the same Lazarus, the poor man. They were both, they were both in the afterlife, right? The rich man was in a place called torment. And Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. That's where all the Old Testament believers went before Jesus died on the cross, Abraham's bosom, also known as paradise, and, and the man that was in torment, the rich man, he said, won't you, Father Abraham, get Lazarus to stick his finger in some water and touch it to my lips. And he said, no, I can't get from over there. We can't get from over there. There's a gulf that separates us. You had your opportunity on the other side. Judgment 
judgment is serious, child of God. Judgment is serious, man and woman of God. This is the time to do business with the Lord. Amen. And, and he says, he, he says, you had your time. And so then he says, this, just send someone over there to tell them. He said, they're not going to believe it because they already had Moses and the law and the prophets and they wouldn't believe that. But if you'd send somebody from the dead, they would believe. No, they won't. They're not even going to believe it if you send somebody from the dead. Well, what is he talking about? See, Jesus knew he's telling the story. That's why he raised Lazarus from the dead because he's about to go to the cross and people still aren't going to believe it. But I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus rose from the dead. His tomb is empty. You can do a research and they found Peter's bones and they moved them from one place to another place, but they ain't never moving around Jesus' bones. And if they knew where those bones were, it'd be the It'd be a museum, right? And they'd be met, right, ridiculing and they'd be laughing. They ain't never found them bones. They will never find those bones. And I know he's alive, and I say this all the time. How do you know he's alive, preacher? Because he's living right here. He brought life, man. He changed his whole heart. If he can change his heart, he can change any heart. Oh, thank you, Jesus. So, so God the Father's mourning. He's mourning over the condition of the human race. He, listen, he wants us to mourn over what he mourns for. He wants us to mourn when we fall short of, the, of his glory. At the same time, he wants, and he wants us to get it right, but he wants to replace our mourning with joy. Though the morning may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There's mourning in, in, in whenever we fail the Lord. Let's face reality. Let's, let's, not, let's not brush it off whenever we failed the Lord in the past. Let's do business with the Lord. Let's get into his presence. Amen. Whether it's in a church service whether it's on the side of our bed, let's do business with the Lord. Let's bear our heart to him and let's tell him, God, wherever I've let you down, thank you for sending your son. I want to, and, and listen, I'm going to tell you something. I, I want to mourn for what the Lord mourns for. And whenever we'll cry out to him, he'll touch that coal just like he did with Isaiah. He'll, he'll cleanse us. Amen. Amen. Have you ever, has anybody in here, I know some of you have, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you've ever really interceded for people. If you've ever, if you've ever, what, what do you mean by intercession? It's a form of prayer. And not everybody's ever, not everybody in the body of Christ has necessarily experienced that. But there's many people that have. And I know that there's probably several people in this place that have experienced that. And, and I got to tell you that I was a Christian for a long time before I ever experienced that. But one of the things that I that I learned is that when it started happening to me, it's almost like it's almost like I felt pain. I, I, I felt heaviness, right? I felt I felt a heaviness on me, and then I would bring that to the Lord. It was like a and I bring it to the Lord, and I begin to cry out. I begin to cry out for whatever the Lord was putting on my heart. Lord, forgive us, forgive us, your church, <laughs> forgive us, your people, forgive us in this nation, Lord, forgive us. You've been so good to us. You blessed us. You know, and that was Daniel's heart whenever he was crying out, Lord, for, forgive us. You're a covenant keeping God. You know, you never let us down, but unto us confusion and shame facing this. I'm not trying. I know that there's many people in here and you're prayer warriors, but look, if Daniel's big enough to use a plural pronoun, surely I can use a plural pronoun. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. Yeah. And, 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 and whenever you feel that heaviness, like, listen to me, church, we, we better get on our knees. We're facing some times right now. I'm telling you right now, if there was ever a time for the people of God to get on their knees with a heavy heart and to cry out to God to move, now is the time. You don't want to wait until, until, the, until it's too late and not, and not be praying. Lord, maybe if we got the heart of Josiah in us, the Lord to give us some mercy. Well, that's just kicking the can down the road. Well, I don't know. All I know is this. God's going to pour out whatever he's going to pour out when he's ready to pour it out. But in the meantime, give me a heart like Josiah, Lord, a true repentance and let, let it be moved down the road. I understand what the word of God says. It says it says that what's written is going to come to pass. But I'm telling you right now, child of God, we got to get our hearts ready. And whenever, when, in God's morning, 
He's mourning over the condition of his people. He's mourning over the condition of this world. He's mourning over the condition of this nation. And, and, and we ain't gonna fix it with a bullet. People trying to fix stuff with bullets. Listen, get out there and vote, but you, the Lord already showed me it's not gonna be fixed in a voting booth. It's gotta be fixed in a prayer closet. We we gotta we gotta seek his face. We gotta mourn for what he mourned for. His heart is broken over the condition and his heart is broken over his people. That, that Help me out, church. His heart is broken over his people whenever we become complacent. Help, help, help me. Start with me, Lord. I don't want to be complacent. I've been complacent before. I don't want to be. It's no more time for complacency. Amen. Help us, Lord. I see this. This is He's saying, blessed are they that mourn. This isn't the kind of preaching that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that people go around preaching this kind of stuff, but it blessed are they that mourn. Mourn for what God mourns for. See, because while it doesn't seem like it makes sense on this side of glory, he says, blessed are those that mourn for they will be comforted. Now, I'll tell you one thing. If you go into your prayer closet with that heavy heart, if you've ever done that before and you make that connection with the Lord and you pray and you seek God and you cry out, all of a sudden he'll replace that heaviness with a joy. You'll walk out of that prayer closet with a whole different person. You know what I'm talking about? But just think about this. Think about if you were mourning on this side of glory and then you, you're going to really be comforted then. Because, see, he's looking for people that will partner with him. I don't understand why the hand of God, why God has placed it this way where he says, no, I need you to pray and I need you to fast. And if my people call by not my name will pray and they will fast and they will turn, I will move, I will heal. I, my hand will move if my people would believe me and to pray. I thank God I got saved in a church where people used to pray. I thank God that my sister went to a church where people believed in prayer. I think that whole church was praying for me. We, we want to see souls wanted to. And I'm talking about real converts, my friend. We want to see people really saved to where they live for God. I'm not saying no struggles in your life. We've all had struggles, but I'm talking about true conversions where the Lord lives in our heart and he begins to lead us and guide us and gives us a hunger and a desire for his word and a hunger and a desire for the things of God. Amen. We need to pray. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I just I wanted to just read this definition out of the uh, the Greek dictionary, the Strong's Greek dictionary. All right, and this is what he, this is what the the, uh, the Greek scholar said in the Old Testament: the meek are those who are wholly relying on God rather than their own strength to defend them against injustice. Anybody experience an injustice sometimes in the house of the Lord? He goes on to say, thus meekness toward evil people. See, because see, God still, God is still requiring that his people behave a specific way. And that's why we have to learn how to get into the presence of the Lord to hear the voice of God. And when he speaks to us, that we would respond the way, because you'll be amazed the effect that our response through the Holy that the Holy Spirit's response through us can have on a person, have a lasting effect on a person. It says this, that knowing this, that God permits the injuries that evil people inflict. God allows things in your life and he allows things in my life. And now listen, some people don't like this kind of preaching, but I'm here to tell you, I'm not backing off of this. That he, is, he uses these things in, in our lives to purify his elect. Amen. And that he will deliver his elect in his time. Yes. Amen. 
When he's ready to bring the deliverance, he will bring the deliverance. But what you and I need to understand is that God uses fiery trials to bring purification to his people. Blessed are the meek. They learn to endure the trial that God has allowed in their life in a way that brings God glory and honor. And when we learn, and listen, meek doesn't mean weak, my friend. I'm here to tell you right now, meek does not mean weak. So the opposite of this would be, again, a proud person who takes matters into their own hands and resolves their issues. And to the listen, we got to be careful. I want to. I want to be care. I want to be clear on this. I've come. I've made a three sixty, man. I was. So, I'm not going to get into why, but I, I for a period of time I wasn't happy with our nation. I'm not going to get into all the details, but I'm here to tell you right now. And I've been trying to say it so y'all know. I'm so glad I was born an American. I'm not going to start singing that song right now. <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, I'm so thankful I was born an American. But can we? Can we, and can we just agree on this, that there's a difference between the American dream and an American dream church? Amen. Hold on. Our God is a blessing God. He's a prosperous God. But I'm here to tell you in America, it's like capitalism and rising to the top like cream, cream in, the, in the milk is not the same thing as what, as what the gospel says. The gospel says I must decrease so that he might increase. And, and good news, good news, if we'll learn how to decrease and let him increase, hallelujah, he'll still prosper you. He'll still put money in your bank account. I believe that. But it's seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. And the mindset can't be, I'm going to do A, B, C, and D, and then I'm going to get E. No, it doesn't work that way. He knows the heart. He knows what's going on on the inside of us. So I just wanted to make that clear because, see, there's a movement in the church, and that's what I've been calling it, the American Dream Church. Where we all get into the car, and it's all Jesus, and then there's a fork in the road. And, and, and the American Dream Church is that bigger is better, and we speak a word in such a way that everybody leaves feeling good about themselves, and we never talk about the, the atrocities that are going on in the hearts and lives of people. And we just only say good words. And we were warned by the Apostle Paul that in the last days, some would depart from the faith and that they'd give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That they would heed to themselves preachers because their ears were tickling. And what it means in the Greek is, speak pleasant words to me, sir. I need to hear pleasant words. And when you keep saying all this other stuff about sin and the things that could be in my life, it's like, la, 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 I don't want to hear it. And, 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 and you know, it's like the, the book is written, and I'm not trying to pick on the preacher, I'm not going to say anything. Your best life now. <laughs> okay, how's that going to preach in the Philippines? How's that going to preach in, in, in India? How's that going to preach to the Apostle Paul when he's in the Mamertine prison waiting for Nero to call his number? How's that going to preach for Thomas when he's run through with a Brahmin spear in his side? How's that going to preach when Mark's drove through the streets of Egypt behind a chariot? It's not going to preach because the world has fallen. And true believers, we have been we have been blessed, my friend, because we have lived in a nation where where Christianity wasn't under attack, but it's under attack now. We better wake up. We better realize it is under uh, There's a full onslaught and, a, and an onslaught from hell and assault from hell upon, upon the, the Christian way of life. Don't tell me that this nation, whenever those four, not the forefathers, but them pilgrims came over here seeking religious freedom. Don't tell me that that's not what it was about because it was. They're trying to take it away. Yeah. Trying to take it away. We're under an assault, my friend. He allows these things in our lives, though, when we go through these things to, to work in us. And, 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 and it doesn't make, people don't like to hear that, but it's the word of God. It's consistent with the word of God. That I must decrease so that he would increase. Amen? And it's the opposite of a prideful heart. I must be poor in spirit. I must be meek. Amen. Because that was what our Savior was. He allows these things in our lives. For the, listen, the, the most horrendous trial in my life, God used it. 
I don't even know where I would be right now. I don't understand it. I don't know why. I, I mean, I try to figure it out. I don't, I don't understand it, but I do know this. Thank God that it didn't turn into me being bitter and angry and hating God. Thank God that he used it to change me, to break me. Lord, keep breaking me. Lord, I know that that's a big thing to say, but Lord, I, 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 I'm going to pray it every day. Lord, put Jesus' heart in me. I don't know what that means, and I don't know what it feels like to get there, but i got to have his heart. And you need his heart. You need his heart in your chest. You need, we need our heart beating for Jesus. Amen. We need, we need him. We do. Thank you, Lord. Now, the Greek origin of the word for that, I, I was reading the definition that this other gentleman put, translated as strength under control. In ancient Greece, war horses were trained to be meek. What this means is strong and powerful, yet under control and willing to submit. Dude, that's powerful. See, a war horse ain't, like, you ever seen them pictures before? They got that armor on their face and they got armor on their, and they look, these things, whenever that, whenever that master's like, yeah, they're running straight into the battle. They're not stopping. So they're submissive, but they're, they're full of power. And it's the same thing of our Lord. Because he was all about the will of the Father. You remember the story when they went to get him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's two different versions. But in one of the versions, he says, he's got his back, he's got his back to them. And he senses them in the spirit. And he's like, whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. And in the Greek, it doesn't say, it doesn't have the per pronoun he. It just says, I am. Ego, I am. I, I am. And he turns, poof, they all fall to their to their face. And then, and then in another one, he says, do you not know that I can call upon my father and he'd send 12 legions of angels? My understanding of a legion is that it's somewhere between three and 6,000. So you're looking at 36,000 to 48,000 angels. I know I said it recently, but one of them knocked out the Syrian army, 185,000 with one angel. I don't know if you believe in the supernatural things of God, but I'm here to tell you I believe in the supernatural things of God. God done spoke here tonight supernaturally. And, and look, there's nothing for him. We just got to learn how to believe him and trust him. He's a good, good God. Thank you, Lord. Number, number verse six. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, Proverbs 16 and 26 in the NASB version, I kind of looked through all the different versions. I thought this would be best. Proverbs 16, 26 in the NASB says this, a worker's appetite works for him for his hunger urges him on. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really deep proverb. I mean, really, you could chew on that for a while. I mean, you could, you could really go a lot of different directions with in other words, when you're hungry, it helps you get up and go to work in the morning. Because you know that around noontime, your, stomach, your tummy's going to be growling. You're, you, you, you're right? You're, it, some translations might even say his mouth helps him in this endeavor. <laughs> hey, you know, it's time to get up and go. You got to earn you, you got to earn you. But, but see, a lot of times we're hungry. We're hungry for that, right? And the scripture says, though, right here, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. See, in the kingdom of God, we're not talking about being hungry and thirsty for food or Gatorade or whatever the case. We're talking about being hungry and thirsty for righteousness, the things of God. Humans are hungry and thirsty for what satisfies them. Jesus was hungry for something different. Amen. We got to learn from our master. Jesus was hungry for something different. The scripture says that when they were baptizing at the Jordan, that they ended up going up through. They went to Samaria. The Bible says that the whole that it says he must needs go through Samaria. King James Version. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit led him to go through Samaria. I'm not going to get into that right now. But let me tell you, he ends up at the well with a woman. Amen. And, and, and to cut through the chase, he gives her a word of knowledge, just like we saw tonight. He gives her a word of knowledge. And he, he actually, I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, go get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. 
He said, that you say is true. You've had five and the one you're with now is not your husband. <laughs> is that seeker sensitive? <laughs> wow. Jesus done read them ladies' mail. And she, but you know what she does after the conversation? She's like, hallelujah. I met the prophet. I met the one that everybody's been talking about. He's coming. And she goes into town and she's like, y'all got to come see him. I met the one that we've been, that everybody's been waiting on. And, and listen, while she's gone doing that and they start walking back, something amazing happens. The, the disciples say, here, Jesus, we got you some food. He said, I got food to eat that you know not of. Wow. Veiled language. What are you talking about? He said, my food is to do my father's will and to accomplish what he sent me to do. Wow. And then immediately, look at this. Let's go ahead and read. There's verse 35. John 4, 35. I'm in the ESV. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, listen, the Samaritan woman that heard the word, she runs to the village. She tells everybody, y'all got to come see him. I'm telling you right now, I believe with all my heart. I can't prove it because I don't think the text really says it. But that she's walking back with the village and Jesus says, I got meat to eat. I got food to eat that you know not of. I'm here to accomplish my father's will and to make sure that it gets done. You say there's four months to harvest? Nay, I tell you, look. Look at the harvest. It's white and it's ready right there. And he's talking about all of these people that are coming from the village and he's letting us know, look at the harvest. You got to get your head right. It's all about the harvest. It's all about the souls. It's all about the people of God hearing the goodness of God, hearing about the truth of God. And how can we how can we do that? We can share it with people. We can get on our knees and pray for people. We can ask the Holy Spirit to move across the land. We can cry out to God. We can mourn for what he mourns for. We can be meek. We can be poor in spirit. Cry out and say, Lord, have your way. Have your way. But now's the time to do it on this side. And you know, if we're honest with one another, and, and I'm not picking on any on any other Christians, I'm definitely not picking on y'all. But do we really think that that's what most Christians are doing? I'm just asking a question. It's actually a great question for a pastor to ask himself. Is that what you're doing, pastor? Are you seeking after God's kingdom and God's righteousness? It's a good question for us to ask ourselves. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about thirst, you know, and I'm going to close after this one. Revelation 22 and 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty, come, let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. If you're thirsty, the spirit and the bride say, come. Man, it's so powerful. We could spend, we could spend a good bit of time on that. The Holy Spirit and the bride. <clears throat> Did you know you're the bride of Christ? If you are a true believer tonight, and listen to me, if you are truly born again, if you have cried out on Jesus, if you have accepted him as your, sa as your Savior, don't let the devil try to steal it from you. I'll never forget whenever I first got saved. I'm telling you right now that, that sister to it, she said, son, you need to keep coming back. Don't you let it. I thank God that I thank I, Thank God for my, my sister. I, it's so good to have y'all here. My sister and my brother-in-law, look, I'm telling you right now, they believe in going to church. Amen? And thank God for that. Amen. Thank God because, that. and look, I'm so glad. Even though I didn't even know what I was doing half the time, especially not in them early days, I didn't even know why am I even here. But now they want me to get my money. <laughs> and I wasn't happy about it. But they are, I went. I told y'all that story the other day. I went and asked three different people. And they're like, yep, that's what we do. Hallelujah. And I'm so, man, look, I'm not going back there. But, the, but look, the spirit and the bride say come. If you are converted tonight, if you've received the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are the bride of Christ. And the Holy Spirit's been calling people. Well, if you're thirsty, won't you come? Won't you come and drink of the waters of life freely? I'm going to close with this. Uh, singers, musicians, we're going to play a song. The altars are open. I want to pray with you. We're going to go out of here and we're praising the Lord, though. Amen? Amen. I guess, yeah, so I'm just going to let you back get ready. But Have you ever been in a situation where you realize you were on the verge of dehydration?
<laughs> I used to do a lot of extreme stuff where I run run out in the middle of the heat. I still kind of do that sometimes. And 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 then I wouldn't I drink coffee or something. Then all of a sudden it's like I'm like my knees are a little weak, you know. I'm like, oh Lord, I haven't been drinking water. I'm almost dehydrated. And I'd go in there and I'd guzzle a couple of glasses and then it catch up. Y'all ever been almost there before? Your heart rate's not going too fast yet. You're not, you don't need IV fluids, but you but your your body's you're feeling that, right? And then so in, in that moment right there, like what is your mind thinking about? You usually your mind's thinking about Gatorade and water, right? Amen. <laughs> When you're thirsty like that, or famished with hunger, it's all you can think about at that moment. And I was just asking this question today, what do we think about most moments of the day? And we probably shouldn't answer that too quickly. Take your time and be spiritually sober about that question. Let us be honest with ourselves and ask, what are we hungry for? What are we thirsting for? I want to tell you that anything else gets in the way of God's plan, and Solomon would have called it vanity. You know, there was a specific year I was thinking about this because I had a conversation with somebody the other day. There was a specific year here recently, probably about three or four years ago. I made more money in that year than I've ever made in my life. And you know what I was doing? I was thinking, I was already planning, I'm going to beat it next year. I'm going to make more money next year than I made this year. I'm telling you right now, the Lord is prospering me, my friend. Oh, yeah, the Lord put work ethic in my heart. I'm going to get up earlier. I'm going to sell more rooms. I'm going to see more patients. I'm going to still be a pastor. I'm going to do all of this. And you know what I realized? I realized something went, got squirrely on me. <laughs> God had already been blessing me. Thank God for his blessings. But somehow, some way, something got twisted off. And it wasn't right. And you know, I was sharing that story with somebody, and they were like, well, it was John. And I was sharing that story with John. He said, you know, a reporter asked the old man Rockefeller one time, when is enough going to be enough? And you know what he said? He said, I just need a, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And we got to be careful, church, right? With whatever it is that would get in the way and would prevent us from being hungry or thirsty for the things that God is hungry and thirsty for. Stand to your feet tonight. Let's go out of this house worshiping the Lord. Amen. And ask.